Well, let, let's start uh, the fifth uh, section on uh, brain aging. And the first speaker uh, is Dr. David Rubenstein from the University of Cambridge. Uh, and he's going to talk about autophagy, a guardian against neurodegeneration. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank Aubrey for inviting me to speak and to tell you about some of the work we've been doing. I'm going to divide my talk into three sections. First, I'm going to give you a brief overview of some recent developments in autophagy biology. Then I'm going to describe how we believe that autophagy upregulation might be a therapeutic strategy one can employ in a range of neurodegenerative diseases. And I'm going to end off by telling you how autophagy compromise, on the other hand, might be a feature of various other diseases um, and show both how genetic lesions causing these diseases as well as environmental insults that contribute to pathogenesis uh, might, um, in fact, compromise autophagy. This is a figure from a review I wrote a number of years ago which describes um, what was understood by autophagy. So in this process, double-layered membranes form in the cytoplasm to engulf a portion of cytoplasm, and these are known as autophagosomes. They are trafficked um, along the microtubules, which are like railway lines in the cells, via dynan motors, which traffic them towards um, an area close to the nucleus known as the microtubule organizing center. And the autophagosomes need to be trafficked to this part of the cell because it's at the microtubule organizing center that the lysosomes are clustered. So it brings the autophagosomes to close to where the lysosomes are. And this enables autophagosomes to eventually fuse with the lysosomes and for the lysosomal hydrolases to degrade the contents of the autophagosomes. When I did this, um, there were some question marks here, and this is an edited version. Actually, the version I sent in had much bigger question marks. And now we understand a little bit more about what those question marks are. And this is a review that's probably coming out tomorrow. Um, and this suggests that um, the sources for the autophagosome precursors might be the plasma membrane, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And the plasma membrane contributes to autophagosome precursor lipids, both under basal conditions of autophagy, as well as when autophagy is upregulated, for instance, when you starve cells. Um, there are data suggesting that the endoplasmic reticulum contributes to the autophagosome precursors under starvation conditions. Um, and that mitochondria membrane might also contribute, particularly under situational of glucose starvation. Um, I'm a little bit biased about the plasma membrane because this is a, an observation that originated from my lab. Uh, and this is what we think happens. So um, we describe that key proteins involved in the early stages of autophagosome formation, and for the aficionados, it's the ATG512 complex and ATG16. Um, are co-localized and actually interact with the clathrin machinery that forms clathrin-coated pits um, that mediates a major form of endocytosis. Um, and what happens is that after the in initial stages of endocytosis, one forms a vesicle, very early endocytic intermediate, which uncoats. And one is left um, with an early autophagosome precursor that contains these key proteins, which ultimately matures into an autophagosome. Indeed, we showed that if one blocks the scission, so if one sort of arrests the endocytic um, events at this stage, preventing the final formation of an early endosome, in the early endosome or intermediate, one um, accumulates all the autophagic precursor proteins here and actually blocks the formation of autophagosomes. One of the observations we made when we did the study was that these autophagic precursors were very small compared to what they need to be when you formed an autophagosome. And recently, um, we've expanded upon this and have shown that these autophagosome precursors actually fuse to become larger structures. And when they become larger structures, they then acquire the capacity to obtain um, other proteins that are critical for the formation of a mature autophagosome. Um, and hopefully this movie will illustrate the fusion events. 
So if one looks here, one can see, hopefully, that two of these early order phylogenetic precursors are fusing and actually end up being a larger structure. And this is critical for the development of the subsequent order phylogenetic. Now, you might worry why I'm telling you about all this rather intricate cell biology. And the reason is because this is our problem that we're interested in. This is a lady with Huntington's disease, with this, which is a devastating um, neurodegenerative condition. It's autosomal dominant. Um, and people get it typically at about 40 um, and die about 15 years after onset. And there's nothing we can do to stop the progression of the disease. This lady has a daughter, and as it's autosomal dominant, she has a 50% chance of having inherited the mutant allele. Indeed, she's inherited the mutant allele. At the moment, the daughter's entirely normal. In fact, she's probably super normal. She's a Cambridge graduate, and she's an Olympic athlete. And so the objective is to see, can we delay the onset of disease in this young lady? In fact, if, can we buy her as many years as possible of good life? And so that is our objective, and I think the objective of many people in the field. We're interested in Huntington's disease not only because it's a devastating condition for the patients and their families, um, but also because I think it serves as an exemplar for many of the late onset neurodegenerative diseases that afflict people. And in that sense, um, it shares the phenomenon of intracellular protein aggregation. So one sees this in Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, prion diseases, um, and one can see it in Parkinson's disease, forms of motor neuron disease, and even in a muscle disease called oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. In the diseases which manifest this phenomenon, where it is caused by a mutant protein that is um, aggregating, the mutant protein is causing disease, in most of the cases where we understand, by a toxic gain of function mechanism. That is, the mutant protein, possibly or probably because of its propensity to aggregate, is a poison for the cells. And therefore, a uh, rather simplistic, but I believe tractable strategy is to see if we can enhance the clearance of the mutant protein. Can we enhance the removal of these toxic entities from the cell? And a number of years ago, we showed that this was potentially possible by upregulating autophagy. So if one decreased autophagy, either by decreasing formation of autophagosomes or by blocking autophagosome lysome fusion, one slowed the clearance of the mutant protein. It's worth pointing out that we're slowing the clearance of the mutant protein not at the stage of the big aggregates. That's not what we think. We're stopping the clearance we, at the level of the oligomism, the soluble entities of the protein that ultimately will become the big aggregates. And by slowing the clearance, we increase the levels of the soluble toxic protein and of the aggregated form of some toxic protein and enhance toxicity. Conversely, if we increase autophagy, well, it has beneficial effects. At the time we did our first experiments, the only way of doing this with a drug that was known to work with in people was use, to use rapamycins, and I'll come down to that just now. And we showed that these rapamycins could enhance the clearance of the mutant Huntington in cells, flies, and mice, and decrease the accumulation of the mutant protein and alleviate toxicity. So the rapamycins work to induce autophagy by being very specific inhibitors of a protein called the mammalian target of rapamycin. The mammalian target of rapamycin normally inhibits autophagy, and by inhibiting the mammalian target of rapamycin, which I'll abbreviate as mTOR, one is disinhibiting it and thereby inducing the process. And so one can see in primary striatal neurons representing the cell population that's most afflicted in Huntington's disease, one increases autophagosome numbers and indeed autophagosome formation. And um, one can measure this, for instance, by looking at the levels of this protein LC32. One also um, alleviates signs of the disease um, in transgenic mice. Um, these transgenic mice that were made by, um, uh, by Chris Ross and David Borchild at Hopkins, um, we got into the lab and treated with the rapamycin analog um, called CCI779. And the reason we used the CCI779 which was the rapamycin of choice for clinical use. We showed that it behaves exactly like rapamycin, but has favorable solubility uh, and, and stability properties compared to native rapamycin. 
And so we thought we might as well use the best clinical rapamycin in our mice. Um, our mice have four behavioral um, tests in which, which discriminate them from the wild type glutamate, and all four are improved by the rapamycin analog. This is the accelerating rotor rod test. We put the mice on this accelerating rod. It's a function that is impaired in these mice. These mice get sick at 12 weeks of age and die at 25, 26 weeks of age. The rapamycin analog has no effect on the performance of the mice um, before um, disease, before we start treating them at six weeks of age um, on any of the tests, but you can see a dramatic improvement in the rotor rod performance and indeed on the other three tests. It's important to point out that the rapamycin analog has no effect on the behavior of wild type mice. In addition, the rapamycin analog gets into the brain affects mTOR signaling in the way we expect it to and reduces the accumulation of the mutant protein in the mice. We wanted to test whether this was something that was Huntington specific or maybe has broader relevance in neurodegenerative diseases and indeed it has broader relevance. So we showed with a number of polyglutamine diseases, most importantly this um, protein called ataxin 3 which when expanded um, like mutant Huntington with a very long polyglutamine tract gives you the most for, uh, common form of spinocerebellar ataxia. And indeed we've shown this as an autophagy substrate in cells as well as in mice where we showed that the rapamycin analog also has dramatic effects on its phenotype and reduces the load of the mutant protein. We've shown it with isolated polyglutamine expansions in cells and in Drosophila which can be rescued with the rapamycin. We've shown it with long polyalanine tracts Importantly, we've shown that tau in its wild type form associated with Alzheimer's disease and with points mutations associated with frontotemporal dementia is an autophagy substrate and can, can alleviate the toxicity of either of these forms of tau in Drosophila by treating with rapamycin. Finally, we've shown that mutant forms of alpha-synuclein that give you familial forms of Parkinson's disease are very good autophagy substrates. It's important to point out that at this point, that the effects of rapamycin in the Drosophila models are autophagy dependent. The target of rapamycin protein is a key cellular integrator of many processes, and so we needed to test whether the rapamycin was acting through autophagy or not. And in order to do these, we put our Drosophila models of the neurodegenerative disease on a genetic background where we'd incapacitated an autophagy gene and showed that the rapamycin had no benefit in that context. While I'm enthusiastic about rapamycin, it's not like taking a half an aspirin a day. If we want to mediate some type of protection for that young lady in the slide, we might need to treat her for many decades, um, hopefully for as long as she lives. And so we need a drug that's going to be safe and relatively specific. And so my lab has been trying to identify pathways and drug targets for autophagy that are independent of the target rapamycin. This is the canonical pathway regulating the target of rapamycin, which can start with um, insulin signaling, activating AKT, and ultimately mTOR activation, which will block autophagy. And as I mentioned earlier, rapamycin disinhibits this effect. What Sovan discovered a number of years ago um, was the first pathway that was independent of the target of rapamycin. And he showed this could be mediated by decreasing the levels of inositol triphosphate. Um, this did not affect um, mTOR signaling, and importantly, if one decreased IP3 levels and decreased um, mTOR activity, one could get greater um, autophagy induction and it, greater enhancement of clearance of the mutant proteins compared to activating either pathway alone. We were excited to note that there were three drugs that were used to treat chronic brain diseases in people that could decrease IP3 levels and these were carbamazepine, valproate, and lithium chloride, and all of these induce autophagy. And so once already increased armamentarian of the drugs, that can be potentially used to treat various neurodegenerative diseases. In addition to targeted studies where we've looked at specific pathways that we think are good candidates, and we've also undertaken a number of drug screens to find autophagy inducers. And this is the second drug screen we published. Um, where we focused on a library that was highly enriched in drugs that are already approved for use in man. And we identified a number of drugs that induced autophagy independently of mTOR, 